Rob, and it's time for a brand new episode of Member Talks. We're excited about today's episode. We are bringing you straight from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Alexandra Joe. How are you today? I'm doing great today, Rob. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, you have bet. Alexandra, you, so uh, let's kind of jump into a little history of how I got to know you a little bit. Mm-hmm. I first started seeing some stuff popping up here and there on social media sites and and I saw this really great article that you authored uh, talking about some statistics that we was in a right up the alley of what we were getting ready to do in our newsletter mm-hmm. uh, a couple months ago. And so uh, I reached out and, hey, can I borrow some of your stuff? Because it was some it was some great um, research. You did some great research on it. Oh, and thank a you. Of, a lot of wonderful uh, statistics. And you were kind enough to say yes. And then I had the privilege of sitting in a class with you in Nashville at the mm-hmm. NFDA convention. And I didn't recognize you. I didn't know who you were. We're sitting in the class. I, uh, and there's a question from the back of the room that pops up. And I'm like, who is this? I turn around I'm like, oh, that's her. It's <laughs> Alexandra. <laughs> so I got yeah. to actually meet you there. And it was so much fun. It was so much yeah. fun to sit and talk with you. Absolutely. That that was, you know, my second ever death care convention. And that was my, well, one of my favorite things about uh, getting to finally go to convention was getting <laughs> to meet all these people that I've, you know, emailed with or right. had professional relationships with in some way or another and yeah. had never gotten to meet before because I've only been in the space for two years. So I joined right before the pandemic shut everything down. So my experience with everyone and all of my colleagues and peers in the death care space has really been on digital platforms until this year. And I went to the New Jersey State Funeral Director Association to present on that research that you're talking about, which I'm sure we'll get into in just a minute. And then got to go to NFDA with my company, Parting Stone, and be part of the team there. So it was really great to meet everyone and have that experience. I bet, I bet. Yeah, it was, it was, I really enjoyed it. I really wanna focus on something though that you just said, you've been in the death care space for two years and Mm -hmm. What you've done, what you've managed to accomplish in that two years time is a lifetime uh, to some folks. I mean, you've really come out strong with not only just a presence of, of knowing what you're talking about, but the science, the, the research to back up the, the not, I don't want to say claims, but the, the, you know, what you're putting out there, you've been part of, you're part of Parting Stone. You're the content manager for Parting Stone. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a great program. We've had uh, Justin on here before to talk a little bit and, and uh, great guy. We enjoy him. And, and yeah. actually what you guys are doing there at Parting Stone is just amazing. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it, if you don't know what Parting Stone is, check it out, look it up. It's partingstone.com, right? Or, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, cool, cool project that you got there um, mm-hmm. of turning cremated remains into solidified remains and yep. uh, being able to transport those and carry those with you. Uh, just a clever idea and, and uh, enjoy you. what you're doing. But Thank you uh, so much. Yeah, yeah absolute. Um, content manager there, mm-hmm. author, contributor to a program called Connecting Directors. Mm-hmm. Um, run your own podcast for... <laughs> Four Parting Stone called Death Care Decoded, Mm -hmm. author of a newsletter called Cremation Rocks and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, creator of of all the different platforms that you can find that on from YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, what don't you do? (laughs) (laughs) That's a good question. Um, You know, coming into this role from working in the labs in Parting Stone, Mm -hmm. I guess I'll go back to the beginning. I have a background in visual art and creative writing. So I have my MFA in visual art, a BFA in sculpture, and a minor degree in creative writing and art history. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I joined Parting Stone working in the lab directly with the cremated remains because it's a lot like a ceramic studio in some ways. It's also a lot like a science lab, and it's also a lot like a manufacturing facility and all of these different things put together is really unique. And then as we started to grow, Justin, who you mentioned before, my wonderful boss and our CEO 
really wanted to expand our marketing department and saw a real need for more forward thinking content in the death care mm -hmm. space. Content being, you know, media like podcasts and a YouTube channel, articles that were well researched and about forward thinking, you know, future oriented topics in the death care space and cremation and serving families. And I was really interested in that because I have been what we at Parting Stone call death curious for a really long time. I was that person in high school who was obsessed with Sylvia Plath and Edgar Allan Poe and listened to the mm -hmm. Misfits and wore a bunch of black eyeliner. <laughs> and then kind of growing out of that and experiencing personal loss for the first time in early college and having an experience with death care that you know, serve the needs of a large portion of my community at the time in a rural town in Alabama, but wasn't really geared towards my needs as kind of like a black sheep in that community that still had very individual grieving needs. I really got curious about how the death care space worked, you know, what, what all goes into supporting families through grieving and what it's like to experience personal loss and that made its way into my art practice in undergraduate and, and graduate school. And a lot of my artwork was about, you know, loss, ephemerality, transience, things like that. I did a whole project looking up my family's genealogy and going around to all the cemeteries in Alabama and harvesting samples of grave dirt and then making sculptures out of that. Oh, so wow. yeah, really death curious for a really long time. And then when I moved to Santa Fe and was looking for a job that was really meaningful, you know, I was working in art galleries and stuff, which is easy to find here, but that's not where my heart was. I wanted to do work that mattered to the world. And I met Justin and he had this idea about solidified remains and making tangible cremated remains that people could hold in touch and continue to have a relationship with. And I was just like, this brings everything that I care about together creation, mm -hmm. art, helping grieving families, learning more about the death care space. So I joined the lab with that art background, was in that position for about a year. And then Justin decided he wanted to expand the marketing department in the company, fill that space for forward thinking content in death care. And I was like, can I do it please? And so we did a little experiment. I wrote some articles. I made some lead magnets. We kind of figured out what worked and what didn't. And you know, nearly a year later, here I am. So I've been in this position since February of this year. And I'm really proud of everything we've been able to accomplish. We have 35 episodes of Death Care Decoded. We've interviewed nice. people from Ryan Thogmartin to Tanya Scotis to Sandra Walker to Barbara Kimmis and Joelle Simone Anthony. And I have learned so much through all of those interviews, talking to these experts in the field who are forward thinking, who care about the families they serve and the funeral directors that they work with and help educate. And from there, I take what I've learned. I do more research because I also have an academic background. You know, I have an MFA and before I left Nashville, which is where I lived before Santa Fe, I taught college at four different universities. I was teaching art history and visual art. And so wow. I have a researchers and an academic background. So that part of the content really comes naturally to me and I really love it and enjoy it. So doing the research to dive further into these topics we get into in the podcast, writing articles, making eBooks and different resources, downloadables for funeral directors to download and help themselves and their staff. Um, yeah, and then making these YouTube videos and creating this Cremation Rocks newsletter that pulls together all of the, the most exciting forward thinking content in the death care space around cremation is really fulfilling. And it's something I really enjoy doing. And this past summer, I was contacted by the New Jersey State Funeral Director Association. They asked me to come give a presentation on research in and around what death care can learn from the 1918 flu pandemic and excess death that I had done for a Connecting Directors article. And so I gave my first continuing education lecture at that convention in September. And it was kind of like tying in my college teaching days and my scholarly research days and this real passion and excitement I have for innovation and education in the death care space, 
all together. It brought them all together and that was really fun. And so I'm hoping to do more lectures and presentations like that in the future as well. So we might have a need for you coming up here pretty soon. Just keep that in the back of the Okay, great. We might, we might be calling you. <laughs> Absolutely. Please, please do. Well, you know, one of the things that I wanted to um, say, this is actually comes uh, stems from a conversation that I had earlier. You mentioned Barbara Kimmis, and I was actually talking with her earlier. And I was telling her, hey, in a couple hours from now, uh, I've got Alexandra, she's going to come on, we're going to have a conversation. We got to talk and, and something came out of that conversation that I wanted to share with you because it does, it, it's very true um, about you and about what's happening uh, there in Santa Fe at Parting Stone. Um, for years, there has, we have not really seen anything in death care, uh, in the funeral profession, whatever you want to call it, that's really transformed. I mean, it, it's been kind of the same thing for the last hundred years. There hasn't been a lot of changes. There's been a few things here and there, but nothing really that stands out uh, as, as a leader or, or has actually disrupted, if you will, enough of the profession um, to make a difference. The, in the last, say, five years or so, we've really seen a shift in that. We've seen a ton of stuff that's coming out, just a ton of stuff, different tech, tech companies, different um, processes, different things you can do with cremated remains. And one thing that I've discovered, or at least that I think I've discovered in, the, in a lot of those, not all of them, but in a lot of those, is they bring all these great products, ideas, thoughts, um, and for that matter, products to the forefront and provide them to family members. But one thing that they seem to, a lot of them be lacking is that connection, that fa family connection mm -hmm. of, you know, we can provide you with something that's going to help you, but mm -hmm. where's that connection to the family? Where's that personalization, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a, a, a term that's used very loosely nowadays with personalization of funerals and stuff, because it's mm -hmm. kind of everything is personalized. But I say all that to say this, what I've seen from Parting Stone, what I've seen from what you guys are doing, and, and, and this isn't a commercial for Parting Stone, but I am pretty excited <laughs> to share this. What I've seen from what you guys are doing, you have taken that missing piece of that family connection, that the you know the heart of what's happening of funeral service you've taken that on yourself and you've kind of built your product around that mm -hmm. to say that you know yeah there's a lot of stuff you can do with cremated remains but you guys are actually not really doing much with them other than turning them into solidified remains but you're right. doing it in a way that is a meaningful from the heart uh way for families to memorialize their loved ones. And, and I don't know if that right. came out right or not, but what I'm trying to say is I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. And I think, well, thank you guys, you. I think what you're doing is something that is definitely extending funeral service from a disruptor standpoint, from a technological standpoint, but as well from a meaningful service standpoint to the family. And I think that's where a lot of folks miss the boat, but I think you guys have nailed it. So. Well, thank you so much. And that's really good feedback to get because that is what we want to do is, you know, one of our mottos that we say a lot is that we want to empower families in their grief, mm -hmm. right? With choices, with options, with a platform for cremation experiences that has never existed before. Yeah. You know, cremated remains for anyone that's ever been around them they know that cremated remains are messy, they're uncomfortable, mm -hmm. they're unsightly. It's something that families who choose cremation really want to have an experience that's meaningful with. And until now, there really hasn't been a good way because there are, like you said, one million things, cool things to do with ashes, right? Mm -hmm. But all of those cool things only use a tiny amount of the cremated remains. And you're still left with like, what, nine cups, 10 cups of granular cremains that you don't know what to do with. And you put them in an urn or you put them in a basement or 
you scatter them and then they're gone. But we have built our business structure around listening to and getting feedback from families that choose cremation, listening to what they want so that we can serve them best. And so what we have learned from correspondence with actual families who've chosen cremation and then solidified remains is that families are looking for some pretty specific things. And one of those is an experience that is meaningful to them, whether that's travel, whether that's touching and holding, whether that's being able to, you know, just keep a stone with them or display them in the home and have it look nice or put them outside in the garden or whatever that is, they're looking for a personal experience that is meaningful and immersive for them in their individual grief. And, you know, the design of parting stones and the solidification process gives you between 40 and 60 stones. They're smooth, they feel good to hold and touch. The, the user interface and intuition is, is really easy because from what I've seen at conventions with our sample stones, what I've heard back from families and what I've heard from other funeral directors and funeral professionals is that immediately when someone sees solidified remains for the first time, they wanna pick them up and hold them. Mm -hmm. That's not the experience you have with cremains. And so that automatically, that intuitive you know, interaction um, really helps families feel comfortable creating their own rituals and experiences with this form of remains. And that's really important to us that it's customizable. It can also make grieving a communal experience because there are enough of them that you can share them with friends and family. 40 to 60, sometimes more is a lot of stones. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. so people are able to easily share them or put some in a special location, like on a hike that their loved one was really fond of, and then also keep one in their pocket and then also have a bowl on their desk at home or whatever it is they wanna do. Give some to the grandkids, give some to the friends. People are making their own custom containers or sewing bags. My most recent, um, the most recent story that I heard was someone took a, an article of clothing from the deceased person, person, cut it up and made bags for each individual stone to give out to their friends. It was super meaningful wow, and very yeah. personal. Yeah. And, you know, another story I love is that one person whose son had passed away, he was in the process of doing the Southwest Chief Amtrak line and had didn't get to finish before he passed away. So the family is doing that Southwest Chief line and leaving a stone at each depot. Nice. So yeah, it's just, it gives me chills to think about people getting to have those rituals and those, those personal experiences in a new way that, that serves them better. And that's really, really important to us at Parting Stone as a company. And that's kind of why we do what we do. And then the other aspect of that is that we've gleaned from feedback from consumers and our customers, particularly that they're very concerned about environmental impact uh, and the environmental impact that, you know, traditional cremains have on water if you you know dump them in a body of water or a tree if you put them all at the base of a tree can be pretty impactful in a negative way not every plant thrives in a super alkaline environment and ashes are super alkaline and so you need to disperse them or mix other things in the soil that you're putting them in to really have a zero zero impact on that environment. Mm -hmm. And we worked with Los Alamos National Labs to do an environmental impact study on cremated remains versus solidified remains and found that if you put cremated remains in water, it takes the alkalinity from a seven to an 11, which is the equivalent of ammonia. And if you put solidified remains in water, it takes the, the acidity from seven to eight, which is water to egg. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have a very have really any impact on the environment when you when you leave the stones out and they don't break down over time and they don't break down in water and so incorporating that into our process and making that really at the forefront of what we're offering families has helped families understand that they're making a good choice in what they're doing with and for their loved ones and that's really really important to us and you're right we're not really doing anything with the cremains except compressing them into a better form we're not really adding anything we're not making art with them we're not you know so so it's just taking the cremation process and serving families better with it which yeah. feels really good yeah. so well, scientifically speaking, one of the you talked about pHs and, and alkalinity and a bunch of things like that. I, I say this uh, kind of jokingly, but two years ago when when Justin came on, um, 
he had sent me some samples uh, mm-hmm. of, of some of the not human samples, but they were animal samples, I guess. Right. Right. Um, sent me some samples to put on the on the table here, and I asked him the question about what, how do these work in water, specifically in fish tanks. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I don't know. I've never tried it, mm-hmm. so. I don't know if you can see it behind me or not, but it, in the background, there is a, an embalming machine that I've turned into a fish tank. And actually inside that is one of those samples. It's been in there for two years and hasn't hurt the fish whatsoever. And every time yep. we clean it, we, we see it there. And it's just kind of fun to look at that and go, oh my gosh, that's one of those solidified rocks. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so great. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really what we engineered this process to do is not have an environmental impact to yeah. stay intact over time. I mean, the stones have the same hardness on a hardness scale test to something that would be like ceramics. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, you can, especially I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, you can go out in the desert and find pottery shards from a thousand years ago that are still intact because they don't break down over time. They're that hard. And yeah, so it's really nice to hear that, you know, they're doing what they're engineered to do. That's really they are great. They're doing that. They're doing that. Yeah. Let's um let's kind of shift gears. I want to talk a little bit about you as, as well and kind of what you got going. Uh, we talked briefly, you're the content manager. You've got a number of different stuff. I mean, you kind of go in all sorts of different directions. Mm-hmm. You've also got some uh the art background and you do a mm-hmm. lot with your art. Um mm-hmm. Where do you have time to do everything number 1, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it's it's just amazing but I, I was curious about your research um you do the research you, you've got the the degree in research or the background in research mm-hmm. you've come up with some topics that are just sort of you know when I first started reading some of them I thought who would think to look at that and then who would <laughs> how would you find this information but yeah. you seem to have uh that knack and and so um I don't know. I just, some of the stuff that you've come out with in the past has been very, very interesting. The talk about the, the flu pandemic mm-hmm. it was amazing. It was oh, thank a, you so not much. Not the talk, but the, the, the uh, article. Yeah. Yeah. The article. Oh, yeah. And the talk is based on the article. It just goes mm-hmm. a little more in depth, but I mean, that came, truly that came out of Kena's cremation, like annual statistics support for mm-hmm. 2020, when they released that earlier this spring, and we had Barbara Kimmis and Don Fritz on the podcast to talk about it, excess death was mentioned, and Barbara kind of raised the question about, you know, what is if a lot of people are dying now that should be dying over the next five to 10 years, what does that mean for us? And I, you know, kind of took that and ran with it, and discovered a lot of, a lot of different research points and topics and subtopics, you know, and kind of found that we could look back into our recent history at the 1918 flu pandemic as an example, because we have enough, you know, census survey and death rate information that we can see that a dip in deaths did happen after the 1918 flu pandemic because of all the excess deaths that happened. But it became so much more complicated because you have to take into account life expectancy, you have to take into account what's happening to death rates in the US before and after a pandemic and excess deaths happen, you know, and, and I spent a good chunk of my year researching this and that research is still coming out because we're still in the pandemic and excess deaths are still happening so those numbers are still changing and growing. And, you know, um, there was a moment where we, we hit this precipice of I don't think there have been enough excess deaths to cause a dip in deaths because mortality rates due to deaths by despair, the opioid crisis, and lack of mental health support have been going up before COVID at such a steady rate. They're kind of counteracting all of that excess death, but the pandemic has gone on for so long, and we've kind of, in my opinion, as a country bungled how we have handled it, um, that we have crossed that threshold, and it looks like there will be a significant dip in deaths whenever pandemic deaths level out. And, you know, it brings up all sorts of things like the healthcare system, the mental healthcare system, the opioid crisis, you know, mortality rates in educated versus uneducated Americans. And, you know, 
population growth rates between Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers, and what it looks like when the largest generation, which is baby boomers, really starts dying out, and those smaller generations are taking taking their place in the ages aging into death, those are smaller. What does that look like when we're also having a dip in deaths from excess pandemic deaths and how do we prepare for that? And uh, it's just been so educational for me. And I'm so grateful that the death care space has been open to hearing and looking at this research that I've worked hard to, to find. And so I guess it kind of all started with, with Barbara on the death care decoded podcast and Kana's annual statistics report. And that really is where I get a lot of my ideas. You know, Justin is highly has been has been so great in helping me and and being really formative in how I look at information in the death care space and get curious about it. You know, curiosity is one of Parting Stone's four core values. And so he's been really instrumental in allowing me to embody that in how I look at and think about things. You know, I mean raising the question of like, will green burial affect cremation rates in the next 10 to 20 years is not something that funeral directors necessarily want to hear, but it's interesting and it's something we need to be talking about. And, you know, even topics like bringing up, are we going to age out of the era of where we wear suits as funeral directors eventually because millennials and Gen Z people are not as into formal dress in the workplace and now everyone's working from home part-time, you know? Yeah. So like that might not be something that, that, that people want to hear a lot, but they're worth exploring because these are real questions and, and real changes that are happening in the world that affect every sector, not just death care, but they do affect death care. So, and then also there's a lot of, there's a lot of content that's really important to me about how we can best serve grieving families. As someone who has experienced grief and loss as a young person and then over and over again throughout my adult life, it's something that's really near and dear to my heart. And so talking to, you know, Joelle Simone Anthony about, you know, being being supportive of families in their grief and, you know, countless other death care professionals, Maggie McMillan and um, on the podcast. And not only having my own personal experience to bring to the table in some of these topics and what I wanted, but hearing professionals that deal with grieving families and, and helping families through that time and what they know works best from their experience has been really meaningful to me as well. So cultivating rituals, personalization and death planning, you know, all of these things, how do we serve families? How do we understand what the experience economy is and how do we build better experiences for death planning families? that's all really meaningful content to me as well. And I hope it's helping people. <laughs> so I think it is, you know, um, like I said earlier, we, for years and years and years, there's been zero change. And that even includes the content that's going out. Mm -hmm. um, there just really hasn't been hardly anything on death care. You know, uh, funeral directors are notorious for just kind of putting their head down, going to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 20 years down the road, all of a sudden they kind of look up and go, I've been doing it the same way for 20 years. Am I doing it right? That must be, that's what's gotten me this far, but you guys are coming up and you in particular uh, with, with articles that I've been reading that you're putting out are coming up with questions that certainly raise that question of, is it the best way? Can mm -hmm. we, can we improve? Um, and and it, it's not necessarily a matter of improving, but it's also a matter of saying, let's take a look at where we've been and where we think it's going to go based on where we've been. I'm, I'm just kind of skimming through some of their past articles. Um, here's your one on the flu pandemic from 1918 we'll, and green burial versus cremation rates. You got all sorts of stuff that you've actually <laughs> just spent time on. And man, when you read through them and you're just kind of like, huh. I've always had a question about it, but there's never been an opportunity really to explore that. You've come up with that exploration and, <laughs> and provided the map. So you're doing great. I love it. Oh, I, I really thank you do. so much. I'm super excited to, to see what you're coming up with next. Thank you so much. That's really exciting. Yeah. I mean, I think not to, you know, give anything away, but I'm, I'm thinking a lot about experience creation right now mm -hmm. and how to, you know, burial has had hundreds of years to develop rituals and memorials and around that form of disposition and cremations really only had like 30 years. And mm -hmm. 
so I was actually doing a podcast interview with Tim McLoon and Sarah Murphy oh, yeah. yes, yesterday, like Dr. Sarah Murphy. Yeah. And um, we, we started talking about this kind of new space for ritual cremation or creation uh, around cremation and how it's a really big opportunity for today's funeral professionals to get to have a hand in what happens because there are a lot of unique and personal needs, but a lot of families, you know, don't know what's possible. And so the more we educate ourselves around that, the more we can offer families and help establish what those rituals are and how meaningful and valuable they are to families. And so I think there's going to be some content in the new year about, about experience creation for cremation families, for sure. I think it's definitely something that we need. I mean, you, you said it, uh, it's had a hundred years to grow burial cremations had 30 years to grow. Look where it's grown. I mean, we're mm-hmm. kind of a lot of, a lot of the funeral homes that we're seeing that are for lack of better terms, dying out, mm-hmm. uh, are cookie cutter funerals. Mm-hmm. And you know, the public that we work with today, the people that we work with today want something that is different, something that is mm-hmm. meaningful. They want that experience versus just the same thing that we did for the last mm-hmm. funeral that we attended. And mm-hmm. so being able to create something, uh, I think is what's going to push us moving forward, push us in a great direction. Fortunately, we have a lot of uh, younger folks coming into the generation or generate younger generation coming into the profession that mm-hmm. have those ideas. Um, my hope is that the people that they're talking to that are their management are o- also open to saying, let's, let's try it, see what happens because you never know what could change it for us. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that that's great too. I I met and saw a lot of young folks that are, you know, coming into the profession at the NFDA convention, which was really Mm -hmm. great. And I, you know, I also, but I also want to say that there's space for both, right? Like we're always going to have families that want a traditional memorialization and permanent placement, even with cremation, but there needs to be opportunity and space equally for all those families that want something different, that want a celebrant celebration or a memorial at a restaurant or a band to play at the visitation or whatever it is, there should be space for that too, along with those families that want something very traditional because their needs and wants are valid too. So that's that's what I'm really excited about is helping helping do some research in in more, you know, data from death planning families and, and customers of funeral homes and, and, you know, draw a map for the experiences that are possible and that are wanted and needed. So. I love it when a funeral director, funeral professional says, all right, look, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to do something different. I'm going to try to create this experience. And it goes off without a hitch. I mean, the family loves Mm -hmm. it. The funeral director comes back rejuvenized and, uh, oh my Mm -hmm. gosh, can you believe that this happened? Yeah. What can we do next? But, you know, leading up to that, it's getting over that first little, well, not little, that first huge hurdle of just listen to your families and help them to create the experience that they're looking for. Not they, well, they won't always tell you what they want, but for the most part, if you listen carefully, they'll tell you what they want. Absolutely. And uh, that's something that almost every single person we've had on the podcast has said, Mm -hmm. like advice for funeral directors is like, not just ask questions, but truly listen to what your family is asking for. And stop thinking of yourself as just a director, but start using your skills, your knowledge and your expertise to fulfill the vision of each individual family. What an opportunity, you know? And, and so I think that you're right. Listen, like not just asking a question and marking down what they say, but like listening, saying, okay, all of these answers are a little bit different, you know, and, and what's the common denominator there? Oh, their person was a music lover and had a big, you know, friend base in the community. So we're going to, you know, bring a band in and, and have all their friends in for this kind of memorial. That's very different than someone else that, you know, was a local football coach. And maybe we're going to do a display of his trophies instead of flowers or something like that. Right. And those are both examples I've heard of memorials on the podcast. So, and a great examples of listening to who that person was and getting creative about how to honor and memorialize that person. That's really exciting to me. 
it goes back to, I think this was actually on your most latest uh, podcast that just came out. At least it's the latest one I heard. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a quote on there and, and forgive me if I mess this up because I'm kind of going by memory, but mm -hmm. the question was, and I, I put it, I actually liked it so much. I posed it onto our, or put it onto our Facebook page to, sit, to see what kind of responses we would get. Awesome. Why, why do people go to funeral homes? Mm -hmm. The number one answer that was on your show uh, that your guest talked about, and it is the number one answer that I'm hearing, well, because somebody died. Mm -mm. It's because somebody lived and somebody mattered. And that's, that's right. why they go to a funeral home. And that's right. that kind of just goes back to exactly what you just said. It goes back to the company uh, standard that you, you know, that you work with, that you work mm -hmm. for, Parting mm -hmm. Stone. Mm -hmm. We're going to provide something because somebody mattered. And that's really the outlook as funeral professionals that we need to have. People come to us because somebody lived and somebody mattered, not because somebody Absolutely. died. They can Absolutely. go anywhere because somebody died. They come to a funeral professional because somebody mattered and they want to share that with the professional and they want that funeral professional to be able to help them share that with the world or to tell that story. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I think you guys are doing. So I'm That's what we hope we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> that's really, that's, that's what we hope we're doing. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, tell me, um, how can we get in touch with you? I know that there's going to be people that are like, who is this Alexander? She's awesome. I want to hear more of what she has to say. I know you can go on to connecting directors, see all your articles, yes. um, but how can we reach out to you if you got a topic or just want to chit chat with you? Absolutely. My email address is mm -hmm. Alexandra, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A -A -A, at partingstone.com. P A R T I N G S T O N E dot com. Perfect. We're going to put that on here as well, and and we'll put it in the uh, message on the Great. on the show, so people have access to it. But thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for coming out and and as we say, joining the conversation. That's sort of yeah. our tagline. Um, that's what we want to do is just have a conversation and put content out there because it needs to be. It needs Absolutely. to be out there, and we want to then get people talking. <laughs> We have the same goal then. And thank you so much for having me on. It's been so great to talk to you. And uh, so I'm so glad we got to connect. Yes, yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. And I can't wait to see you. Hopefully you're going to be up in, uh, well, where's the next one? It's uh, Baltimore, isn't it? Baltimore? Is the next, next NFDA, NFDA one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we hope to hit up some, some state um, conventions between now and then. All right, so, good, yeah. good. Yeah, I'd like to see you. Yeah. I'd like to see you come up this direction. I, I would love that as well, for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will catch you next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.